Greetings and welcome to the Mount Rushmore podcast. This is the podcast where we debate and deliberate the most ubiquitous aspects of a variety of topics. Standing by to do just that are my good buddies, Richard. Hello. And Michael. Howdy. Are we going to just, are we just, I like this, this new persona. Yeah. yeah. yeah I like this, this new fun. Jeff. Yeah. I want to be very professional because uh, the topic is the Mount Rushmore of movies about Los Angeles or of Los Angeles regarding Los or Angeles. In Los Angeles. <laughs> or in Los Angeles. Richard chose it. Explain it, Richard. I there was one movie in particular I was thinking of. There was a very Angelino centric movie, and it just got me thinking about the fact that obviously there are a lot of movies about the about movies, yeah. which are, is in Los Angeles. But Los Angeles itself is such a. There have been so many movies that were. It's not just set in Los Angeles, but where the city actually becomes part of the story. Yeah. Or that you can't imagine this movie taking place in Chicago or New York or somewhere else. Yeah. Like it would have to specifically be a Los Angeles movie. Mm-hmm. So as as someone who is a uh, has thrown my lot in permanently with Los Angeles, I uh, have a lot of civic pride and uh, enjoy watching movies about my adopted hometown. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, why don't we jump in? So uh, Richard chose it. Uh, Michael what do you got? Uh, this might be an obvious choice, but you know, with the Mount Rushmore, sometimes the first choice is the obvious choice because it should be up there engraved on the mountain. But um, L.A. Story. The, also on uh, my list. Okay. That was the movie the, I was specifically thinking about, Michael. Yeah. So good job. The <laughs> 1991 Steve Martin penned um, comedy about um, how ridiculous um, Los Angeles is, especially to like an outsider who just um, kind of has uh, the people that are within it accept all of its weird flaws and foibles and um, kind of this facade that's over it. And then somebody um, enters the scene and uh, everything is just ridiculous to her, except for everybody else involved in it. And they just accept it. Uh, it's a, a very f- funny movie. Obviously, Steve Martin, um, he grew up in southern california i don't think he grew up in la proper but he's from here and has you know uh spent the majority of his career in and around um the strange people that los angeles attracts and produces and um i think that there is just i think it it pokes fun at itself in a way that uh other cities don't Hmm. like i think that if you're like someone from New York, you wouldn't make him a New York movie like this. Yeah. Right. If you're from LA, you're yeah. you totally accept making a movie about this because you understand that there are like have truths in the things that they are making fun of, but it's not all like, it's not all like, uh, they're bad things. They're just like, yeah. uh, silly, f- funny, strange things. And I think it re- really captures a moment of time in the early nineties where um, uh, maybe the image of the town is um, uh, kind of at its peak, I guess. Mm -hmm. Richard, why did you choose? Well, I think that it's this being a Steve Martin movie. It's kind of a quintessential, it's very cynical in some ways, but it's also got a real emotional heart underneath it. And to me, that sums up Los Angeles about as well as anything I can think of. You know, it is a big city, and it's a city that a lot of us are very jaded about. It's very easy to become, you know, very wary and weary of Los Angeles after a while. But when you get underneath the sur- the, the the surface of Los Angeles and, and dig a little bit deeper, it's this big, wonderful melting pot, and it's this city that I think has a ton of heart and I think that I think that the movie kind of mirrors that in a lot of ways Mm -hmm. and also it's just a very funny movie I mean the the personal favorite scene is the uh, scene where they're driving in the car and suddenly realize that it's uh, freeway shooting season <laughs> and everyone's trying to load up on their find their guns in their cars so they can start winging a few shots off at everybody else. 
<laughs> and it's just got a lot of little things that if you're a Los Angeles resident or have spent a lot of time here will ring true to you. Yeah. You know, I, I to, to Michael's point, I this had to be written by somebody who is in in, in C. Martin, I think, is from Orange County originally, but somebody who had spent most, if not all, of your life in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. in the Southern California area. You know, the uh, inanity of your local weathermen who, <laughs> who, who basically have to sit there and can mail in, can pre-record their, uh, their weather reports because the weather never changes. Mm -hmm. And who invariably, each and every one of them seems like they want to be doing anything else but being a weatherman. Yeah. You know, like Dallas Rains or what Fritz Coleman does stand up here, and the, who's the Channel 4 L NBC uh, weatherman. He does stand, been doing stand up comedy for years here in Los Angeles. And just these guys, they, you just get the sense that they all thought they were going to be David Letterman yeah. and used being a weatherman <laughs> as some sort of like launch pad to their major mm -hmm. television career. And they're kind of just stuck here. Yeah. And that's sort of how Steve Martin's character feels. So I think that that's another really smart and, and knowing a lot about Los Angeles kind of touch. Mm -hmm. I think it also captures, um, like you said, with like the driving on the freeways, like there is a car culture here that is just like built into your daily life. And whether it's the ridiculous things like him trying to cut across, trying to get across town and driving through parks and down, you know, if, heavily steep sets of stairs or like yeah. him driving over to his best friend's house, which is, you know, a house down the road. So it's literally, he's just like taking the car off of its parking brake and then putting it back on as he kind of walks <laughs> the car a little bit closer or the entire, uh, setup with driving on the freeway and encountering like the, uh, the traffic signs that start speaking to him as like the voice of Los Angeles trying to, uh, help him figure his life out and fall in love. Uh, you know, I think they really captured that aspect or even like the little getaway up to like Santa Barbara to stay at the, the chicken of the sea <laughs> um, mm -hmm. hotel up there. The, there's all these things that have like these little car centric things and your car here in LA is just built into your, into your life. And I think it, he just captures all of the uh, banality, but also just the uh, importance of it. So completely. Oh, that's fun. Yeah, I love how I feel like Steve Martin and L.A. kind of grew up together in a bit because, uh, you know, he was a guy who um, I think when, when Woody Allen was, was talking about L.A., it was this place that he goes to kind of as a consolation prize for losing, winning and losing Annie Hall. And New York is so different than L.A. And we see Woody Allen trying to drive on the freeways in this big car. And um, I remember that was one of the first things I recall was it seems like even though L.A. is kind of the birthplace of cinema culture, at least in the U.S., was kind of born on the East Coast and, and made its way west. But uh, and, and in film and stuff like that, it seems like the identity of L.A. did not mature um, as quickly as the identity of New York did in in film. But uh when by the time Steve Martin is doing LA story, it seems like he has evolved from uh, a comedian to a humorist and LA and its identity has evolved into something kind of everybody has a sense of, as opposed to what it was like in the fifties, right? Wasn't it just a kind of collection of regions? Like nobody <laughs> thought it right. was one big thing, you know, there's Santa Monica, there's, there's Pasadena, there's, there's downtown, whatever downtown is. Yeah. Cool, fun, fun first choice. All right, uh, then I guess Richard, what's your second? All right, my second choice. Bef actually, before I get to my second choice, Ooh. quick monologue. I just want to point out that I think, and I speak for all of us, that our choices tend to come from a very specific place, as kind of white males, white yeah. straight males. So there are um, several movies on here that just I don't have the familiarity with, or that I think are great movies that could have very easily made the list. Um, you know, like a movie like boys in the hood, uh, a movie like tangerine, which is this great Sean Baker movie about the lives, the end of life of a couple of, uh, 
sex workers on Santa Monica Boulevard. Um, but it's, it's also a very funny movie. Um, so there are a lot of those sort of movies. Um, I cho- personally didn't, my, my, my choices are all kind of white male choices for lack of a better term. Uh, but I did want to acknowledge that our choices, I think at least my choices are definitely coming from a very specific place. So having got that out of the way, <laughs> uh, my second, my second choice is a, it's the only story movie about Hollywood on my list. Well, the Ooh. other one, there's two actually. One of them is sort of tangentially about Hollywood. The only one that's really about, really, really about Hollywood is Sunset Boulevard. Hmm. Okay. Oh, cool. The uh, classic uh, Billy Wilder film from 1950 uh, starring Gloria Swanson as this uh, former silent film star who's trying to plot plot this elaborate comeback and is obviously deranged and trying to uh, do whatever she, whatever, whatever she can to ensure that she can have her one more moment in, in the sun. And I think it's a very specific look at a very specific period in Hollywood, which is this era of it's, it's a look at the era of silent film and early film stars and kind of what happened to them as Los Angeles grew and the film industry grew and the nature of making films changes and people just get left behind. And, you know, we talked about the evolution of Los Angeles a little bit and how it kind of like to Jeff's point, it kind of went from this collection of, you know, sort of outposts of, of, of Western culture almost. And these like, you know, little, outposts that are connected by dust ro- dirty dirt roads to this sprawling metropolis that we know of it to be today. And the film industry changed, you know, it went from silent films to early talkies to, you know, by 1950, you know, more what we would consider to be a, a I guess, closer to a modern uh, film industry. And I just I, I love the fact that they got Cecil B. DeMille to play himself, that they got Hedda Hopper yeah. to play herself. Yeah. They've got Buster Keaton, that Eric von Stroheim plays her, her butler, that they were in, able to integrate all of these figures from the kind of classic days of Hollywood to be part of this movie really about the death of classic Hollywood. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's very funny in its own way, in its own very dark way. It's very funny, so that's why I chose it. That's cool. Yeah, it it, go, it was the colonies. It was kind of the movie Colony. You know, 10, yeah, fifteen years before this movie. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Um, do you? Uh, I think we were talking. Were we talking last week? Or I, I know we've maybe we discussed singing in the rain, and it almost seems like uh, uh, Sunset Boulevard is kind of the dark version of that. Through, yes. Um, with the murder. <laughs> yeah. Stuff. Yeah. It's sort of, it's sort of, you know, what happens 25 years, like 20 years later mm-hmm. to, uh, to everyone in singing in the rain, I suppose. Yeah. And as far as a film noir, there's, uh, so much non noir and there's a lot of bright sunshine and, and things, things that happen in broad daylight in that. In yeah, that absolutely. So, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, we are going to Michael. Uh, my second choice, I'll stay with my, I, I had like a, a Hollywood pick as well, because I figured there there has to be, if you're talking about L.A., um, a film about making movies in some sense or coming to L.A. to make movies or s- something. There, There is no L.A.-ness without like the movie industry. Uh, and uh, my choice is Ed Wood. The uh, 1994 oh, uh, Tim it. Burton film, um, also black and white, like Sunset Boulevard, mm-hmm. but um, it you know it captures kind of the snippet of this uh, man's life, Ed Wood, which is um, you know he was this cross-dressing filmmaker. Yeah, uh, uh, he was a, a actor and stuntman and uh, director of kind of schlocky B movies. This kid that grew up in New York and moved to LA and um, wanted to make films and had this uh, 
this friendship that was depicted as him meeting um, Bella Lugosi and uh, trying to kind of help him with his career, but also falling into um, a friendship and helping him with a, uh, his kind of heroin addiction. Um, so it has like these elements of um, like this last resting place for this kind of fading uh, kind of uh, screen legend, but also uh, this rising, you know, or how he sees it. He sees himself as this great talent uh, in the movie industry, but he's terrible and <laughs> just <laughs> makes the worst movies. Um, but the film captures so many different aspects of LA that I, I really like it. It has all these different weird people that he like brings together, like this menagerie of um, kind of oddities, the Vampirina. Uh, is it Vampirina? Uh, Vampira. I never remember. Vampira. Vampira. Vampirina is a children's uh, cartoon that my son watches. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, the amazing Griswold. And, but also like this weird kind of, um, what's the word? It's, it features all these people that want to make movies as well. And they give this money to this guy to make movies. And, you know, it all kind of goes to hell because he's a terrible film. Yeah. But there's just so many different like personalities and people that are coming for some sort of fame in LA or getting some sort of fame, or there's this weird kind of LA movie Hollywood fameness about it. Um, and I just love that the picture kind of ends with like a, a thunderstorm. We kind of talked about that with like LA story, how like the, the weather kind of is this thing that kind of permeates through the thing. And then just at the end of this movie, there's this huge thunderstorm that opens up on top of them. It's another thing that like never happens in LA. And mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I don't know. The movie I think is just, is just one of Tim Burton's best, if not his best film. And I think just captures uh, a strangeness about LA and strange characters about LA. And, uh, but also has like these just, everything's amazing in it. Yeah. I, I so agree. I, what's one of my favorite Tim Burton is one of my favorite uh, movies. I don't, I don't know what the, you would call the genre, the kind of the backstage uh, drama or the show sh shows about a, a, a band of players. And it could, you could s see it starting in Shakespeare with the plays within the plays and in, in um, uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. And I, I just love anything. Galaxy Quest is one of my favorite movies because it's about a troupe of idiot actors who, mm. who, who the adventure becomes real for them. And you know, one thing about um, that era, that sunset Boulevard era um, was Hollywood was starting to be a place where nobody could kind of cover up all these mistakes. And they had these like amazingly um, prolific fixers, studio fixers. Um, and I remember there was reading a book by Eddie, Eddie Mannix, one of the studio fixers who described Hollywood as if you picked up the U S and shook it. Everything that wasn't tied down falls into Hollywood. <laughs> it's basically all, <laughs> all, all the losers, all the garbage, all the people with with uh, questionable um, uh, um, intent. All and we played kickball Hollywood. with most of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. But that's what's funny. so I great was, about. I was walking, uh, just a, a real weird LA uh, sort of feeling. I was walking my dog the other morning, and it must have been seven in the morning or something, just in my little neighborhood and some guy was just walking down the street and he was wearing like um full like alligator skin boots and like black yeah. really tight jeans and like an almost matching like a uh, kind of silk alligator screen uh, skin kind of printed silk shirt and like he had you know, kind of long bush he kind of looked like you know uh, slashes um <laughs> you know, Stylist. younger nephew, you oh, know, okay. his, this you know, cowboy hat in his hair and he had a guitar slung over his shoulder. And he was just walking down like Irvine, like just this yeah. neighborhood street. I don't know where he was going. And I was like, oh, well, there you go. Los Angeles. <laughs> I don't think there's anybody yeah. in LA who planned, who isn't on a plan B, C, D, or E, <laughs> because <laughs> nobody, nobody thought, you know, I'm going to go to LA and work uh, really hard, a little bit at a day, and eventually in 20, 30 years, I'm going to accomplish my dreams. <laughs> Everybody thought they were going to make it right away. And I, I love to LA. It's full of people who had it fucking good wherever they're from. Um, <laughs> and they decided, oh, hell no. I'm not going to settle down with a girl next door who loves me and likes to wants to bake for me. And 
live in the, the three-story Victorian home my, you know, my grandparents built. I'm going to go to LA and be a PA on two and a half men. Like I'm, <laughs> that's the dream. <laughs> what a bunch of idiots. Oh, fucking love it. Love Do you it. miss it, Jeff? Oh, you want crazy? Come to Orlando. <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot of big dreamers out here too. Uh, you think you see somebody in alligator boots walking down the street, Michael? You see somebody uh, in actual a walking actual alligators down the alligator. street. <laughs> <laughs> they got whole areas that they couldn't get rid of the alligators, so they just slapped up a sign and made it a theme park. Uh, all right. Well, speaking of. Uh, um, uh, uh, odd uh, middle middle grounds between one reality and another. It is our halftime, and uh, I'm going to invite you to go out to our website and um, send me links to all the things that are screwed up there. <laughs> Richard has been trying to wipe them out, and he does uh, with with uh, great with, diplomacy with, with I mean, glee. With glee. <laughs> um, but I got to fix a lot of stuff. But if you do want to go there, what I love about it is um, it's kind of Richard and Michael's marketing savvy writ large because all the images are really, I think, vivid. And they bring our, our brain. It's almost like a barf of our brains from the last six years. Yeah. <laughs> Out of the website in the pictures and the copy and all that stuff. So that's a lot of fun. And then uh, once you're there, uh, see what needs to be added and, and let us know that in the form of a suggestion for a topic. If you're into Netflix original films, if you appreciate unpretentious movie reviews, and if you're the kind of person who knows that despite our political differences, we can unite over the love of a good movie or the abject loathing of a terrible one, then we might just have the podcast for you. I really thought we talked about not saying it like that. Like what? Okay, anyway, the podcast is called Watching Netflix Without You. And to listen, you can visit our website for a list of podcast players, wnwypodcast.com slash subscribe. Seriously, like what? I swear to God. Okay, so we're back. And at this point, I think uh, Richard is now sharing his third. All right. My third choice is something that is off the record, on the QT. Oh, wow. wow. Very hush-hush. I am, of course, talking about the movie L.A. Confidential. Oh, okay. Super choice. Super choice. Yeah. Um, you know, a, a, night, a movie set in the 1950s, kind of around the world of Hollywood. This is the one where I was kind of like, it's sort of around Hollywood, but it's not necessarily a Hollywood movie, although it has a lot of Hollywood touches around it. Um, and it kind of... Sh- It's a great example of a modern kind of a neo-noir sort of film. You know, we talked about Sunset Boulevard being kind of a noir film, Mm -hmm. but but also very bright. This is kind of a a, a 90s take on a a 50s, 40s or 50s noir movie. Um, And I just, I chose this movie, I think, because it really shows, much like with Sunset Boulevard, I maybe I'm a little fascinated with the seedy underside of Hollywood. Um, you know, I love, I love the, you know, though I don't like the actor Kevin Spacey's character Jack Vincennes, that his his main thing that he loves doing more than being a cop is being this uh, technical advisor on this stupid TV police show, this dragnet type show, uh, badge of honor. Um, and that's kind of what he loves more than anything else. Cause he gets to mingle with celebrities and he's kind of obsessed with this. <laughs> um, you know, I love the, I love, uh, Simon Baker's got this character kind of his names, Matt Reynolds this kind of struggling actor who he winds up getting kind of getting screwed over, over and over, kind of getting screwed over by, uh, the forces, the, the powers that be, including uh, Danny DeVito's unscrupulous uh, tabloid mm-hmm. uh, publisher, and I think he's got he's got he's he's got a great little character arc within all these other bigger things that are happening. But in terms of Los Angeles, yeah, I mean it's it's 
you know, it's based off a James Elroy novel, and he's somebody who knows kind of who is as much of a historian of that era of Los Angeles and kind of the everything that was happening behind the scenes. And I, I, I love kind of the old going through, I have books of old, old tabloids from Los Angeles, you know, like the old tabloid newspapers and things like that. And a lot of the, the photos that were in there and the stories that were, that were written. I'm, I'm fat. I'm endlessly fascinated by that. I'm endlessly fascinated by the corruption of the LAPD back in the, 30s and 40s and 50s which thank god we're past that now yeah by the way um and i just i just think it's a fantastic movie it's it's it's, it's certainly is something that that i rewatched multiple times and i'm always able to find something kind of interesting and new in it so mm-hmm. yeah la confidential i gotta rewatch that because i think at the time i was peeved one that two Australians were playing Angelinos. Uh, sure, <laughs> and I think I was peeved by kind of the the where the music was. The score was. I had a beef with the score because it was trying to like tell me how dramatic everything was, and I had felt like it hadn't earned it or something like that. But I I, I think I walk into film sometimes with a chip on my shoulder, and and I need to just go in and let something do its job versus try to you know I don't know I don't know change me first or something like that yeah i i I, one thing i should point out is i really loved how they kind of integrated actual people into the movie Mm -hmm. whether it's mickey Mm -hmm. cohen or johnny stampanato or lana turner Uh how they were able to kind of add to the realism of the movie by kind of integrate weaving these real life people yeah into the plot oh that's fun okay okay cool uh winfield what's your third choice i'm gonna stay in a similar mindset and mine is the 1974 film chinatown because i thought one thing that is very interesting about la is kind of the origins of it but also the sprawl of it and how big this goddamn city is like um and i think the film really captures uh some aspects of it um uh the story is about you know kind of two things it's about um a corruption and murder and this the plot to kind of steal water from the Owens Valley um, to kind of fuel LA and kind of to, to source LA as a place to um, be livable, but not just Los Angeles, like the uh, San Fernando Valley. And, um, you know, Jack Nicholson plays uh, detective um, Giddies in it. And he's kind of slowly kind of uncovering this plot. He's, um, not quite a detective, but he's like a photographer, a private eye. And um, he slowly uncovers uh, this murder that happens that leads him to kind of figure out um, all this land that's being purchased and the reasons for that. And I love that it captures like this kind of, um, you know, kind of, uh, Oh, what's the art, this Art Deco LA that kind of exists from time to time here and there that you can still see the kind of like, you know, post 1920s, 1930s kind of LA that um, is just so interesting to look at that you don't, you only see kind of glimpses of nowadays before it's kind of been kind of knocked down. But then you get these glimpses of like how the valley was just like this huge farmland. It was all orange trees for, for forever and ever that um, nobody lived in and it was so empty. It's hard to think now of LA as ever any parts of it are being empty except for kind of even maybe like Griffith Park. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, even that's, yeah. you know, it, it gets encroached upon. But um, I think that LA is this very strange, it's LA has a feeling almost like um, uh like Las Vegas, that it's kind of been willed into existence and it's been forced into existence. I mean, you know, like New York or Las Vegas exists because they built it there and they they just kept building it and they kept financing it. And it's just, it's there and it probably shouldn't be there. And I think LA almost has those same sorts of um, that feeling about it, that, that it's been willed into existence rather than people moved here for a a specific reason. And I think that 
are elements of that in in Chinatown that are pretty interesting that like the powers that be are making this thing happen and the money is too much for anybody and the corruption kind of extends all over. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, those all, all things, those, those kind of really uh, resonate with me too. Uh, LA, because it has be, been the emanating kind of transmission point for a lot of what is American culture and not just cinema or whatever, it's just kind of American culture has been almost kind of been like blasting out of this place for so long. It's, it's, hard to imagine as an outpost in an unfinished uh, afterthought that it was, was even though, uh, like you said, it, we were seeing it in its first kind of modern era, it was still the Wild West and a place where um, shady characters <laughs> could do just about anything. And then within that film, there is this smaller community. Um, Forget it. It's Chinatown. It has its own rules. So here's this place with its own rules inside a place that has no rules. So yeah, do you ever hear the story about Chinatown in LA? That it was that the, the Chinatown where it is now was not. No, it was it was, it was yeah. ripped up. Yeah, basically, yeah. and 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 they and moved wholesale to yeah. where it is this current location. And the, the railroad companies um, were being um, forced into unification. This there were like three railroad. Uh, sorry, there were three um, main terminals for the different railroad companies. And the city said, no, you guys have to go. You have to have one, one terminal where all the different mm -hmm. lines meet. And it was where Chinatown originally was. And the Chinatown we had then was like the Chinatown in San Francisco it, or New York. It was built by people from China. And the Chinatown that they made uh, and forced the people to move it into was built by 20th Century Fox and Disney and these designers from these studios who built these uh, buildings that were uh, racist, essentially, <laughs> and, and had neon signs for, for names of people that didn't exist. And they said, oh, here you go, move in. It's like, that wasn't, that's not our place. Oh, uh, not surprising. Nutty, nutty. Okay, so... Uh, now Richard's going to let us know his last choice. Uh, my last choice, uh, sticking with the film noir theme, I'm going with the 1996 film Swingers. A lot of fun. <laughs> it's well, it's very noir. The, y yes, the I mean, very very darkly film. lit. Yeah. Uh, lots of, no. Double cross. And I, know, I, and I believe, and we talked about this off the air a little bit, I believe I may have mentioned the fact that I saw Swingers eight times in the theater. <laughs> I believe in the past we've just we we kind of I think we discussed it. I can't remember what the what it was, but my as part of my uh, kind of swing dancing, yeah, hipster fifties phase that I went through, kind of in college and early early years outside of college. But the movie itself is a gem. It's a delight. Written by John Favreau, uh, kind of based on his experiences moving out to Los Angeles, um, trying to become a comedian, go into this, do, do work in the stand up circuit, hosting a, uh, hosting a stand up night, which I know Jeff, you have some experience oh, yeah. with. Oh yeah. 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 Um, and his like kind of motley crew of friends who join him going from nightclub to nightclub, trying to find the beautiful babies, so to speak. <laughs> and, this one to me, I just, it's, it's something that's dear to my heart just because like I said, I, that w w with the exception of trying to find the beautiful babies, the going out to the nightclubs and wearing the, uh, the polo shirts and the, and the hats and, and thinking that you're Frank Sinatra, that was definitely part, that was definitely a big <laughs> part of my life in my mid, mid early to mid twenties. And so I, you know, the places they go to the Dresden. I was a regular at the Dresden. They go to Smog Cutter. They go to the Derby. All these three of clubs, all these places that they go to. Those were the places I was going to back then. I'm a little surprised I wasn't there one night when they were filming one of those, one of the, one of the scenes. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very personal choice for me, but I think it does a great job in not just capturing a very specific a very specific period in time in Los Angeles is mm -hmm. nightlife. Um, but I think it also captures the, 
the kind of feeling of really just being in Los Angeles and it's not working out. Mm. <laughs> you know, none of them, you know, like uh, Vince Vaughn's character, Trent, he, his big claim to fame is he had an after school special when he was a kid actor. Um, <laughs> Ron Livingston's character is spends the first half of the movie very upset because he now has to audition for Goofy at Disneyland. <laughs> and then spends the second half of the movie upset because he didn't get the role of Goofy at Disneyland. Which yeah, I think is pretty awesome. is, is pretty great. So <laughs> I think it, it, it really does that. It captures that sort of, you know, we've seen movies with struggling actors before and, 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 and that. But I think it really kind of gets to the heart of, I moved out, like you said, Jeff, all of the people who moved out to here to chase their dreams and maybe they're a few years into it and they're wondering what the hell am I still doing here? Yeah. And yeah. it kind of goes to show the Los Angeles, if you're willing to, if you're willing to kind of let go and kind of enjoy the city, there's a lot out here that's worthwhile. Mm-hmm. But you know, from Mike's point, he's so caught up in his ex-girlfriend in New York that he can't quite see the forest for the trees. So I yeah. think it's got a nice, a nice message kind of hidden within all of the all of the comedy. Mm-hmm. He's also, I mean, he's also surrounded by you know Vince uh, Vince Vaughn's character, whose name escapes me, who's Trent. constantly Trent, who's constantly trying to tell him how he needs to be in LA. That he he's never quite quite allowed to be himself until the end of the movie. You know, he's right. constantly trying to live up to this image of being in LA or like, this is what you have to do to get the girls. And this is, uh, you know, obviously he falls on his face. Um, in the end <laughs> it's of spectacular. It. It's such an incredible scene. And, um, you know, he ultimately, he does seem to find himself by the end of the movie. And he does seem to find some feeling of love, which often that kind of helps you stay in a place like LA. Like, yeah. Um, like if you move to some place and you're, um, you know, kind of thinking I've been here for a few years, I'm going to go back home. But then you meet like the right person, then suddenly where you are doesn't seem to be that much of an issue anymore. Yeah. I, think, I love the connections between Ed Wood and uh, Swingers <laughs> because at the heart, there is a B story. That's really the romance between two two dudes Um, yeah and the one who's somewhat of a mentor and one some somewhat of a neophyte and uh, they're really both off base (laughs) and they're really kind of helping the other one kind of dial in a little bit more closely to reality i think uh uh mike kind of grounds trent a little bit um and Trent is really just kind of be a hype man. You're so money, baby. You don't even know it for Mike in his and help him pick himself up and put himself back together. So um, as Ed Wood does for for uh, Bella Lugosi. So yeah, those are really fun. And meanwhile, is, there. Go ahead. I was gonna say he is the best friend that you could ever have, and also the worst best friend that you could ever have. Oh, oh yeah. Both at the I, same I, time. I was gonna say the the chemistry that they took with them to made and i don't know how many other films that they've had a -a tete-a-tete in it like to see vince vaughn wind up john favreau is one of the most entertaining (laughs) things in the world it's like they've got this hope and crosby kind of like um energy with each other that is just amazing yeah yeah that's a lot of fun okay um what's the last one mr winfield uh well i've We've talked about a lot of the past of uh, Los Angeles. Now I'm going to delve into the near future of Los Angeles. Oh, snap. With the uh, (laughs) 1993 uh, movie Demolition Man, starring (laughs) Wesley Snipes and Sylvester Stallone as Simon Phoenix and John Spartan, uh, two warriors from a past age thrust into the future to face off once again um, in not quite Los Angeles. But San Angeles, San Angeles. <laughs> since uh, Los Angeles was knocked down uh, in a horrific earthquake because, of course, Los Angeles. And so they built this gigantic, sprawling metro city that kind of covered. I can't remember if it was from Santa Barbara down to San Diego 
or if it was just Los Angeles and San Diego, regardless, mm. it is a huge megalopolis of Los Angelesness in the future. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, it was funny, Richard, when you kind of uh, threw out this topic initially, um, I thought you said you had a very interesting kind of take saying like, what movie could, couldn't have been made any anywhere else? And this movie was like one of the first ones that came to mind because of the ridiculousness of an earthquake knocking things down. Where does there's only one place that people will acknowledge that earthquakes happen, even though they happen all over the world. But Los Angeles is just one of them. Um, but I I love that it has like these like this two tiered system that it's kind of developed. Like not only is there like this kind of um, kind of ruling class, kind of more effete, more like uh, you want to see almost like this woke, um, better than thou sort of people on the surface. You have like this kind of gigantic homeless population and uh, that kind of lives underground, kind of moloid or what? Are, what were the ones from um, uh, the Time, Time Machine? Machine. Uh, the Eloy and the. Uh, Sleeve stacks? No. More, more docks or <laughs> more locks, yes. There's like this yeah. kind of two tier kind of system of people um where uh there are some people that are just seemingly better than others and they're wealthy and everything is this kind of near utopian, but you kind of scrape off like the facade and the veneer and there's like, oh, there's a lot of just really messed up stuff going on, hunger mm-hmm. and homelessness and uh all these different things that that the people on top are trying to cover up. And um, I don't know. I think that as a Los Angeles movie, it just packs so many different um, kind of LA um, uh, architecture and just the feeling of it's very, it's a, you know, for so much of the movie that's um, kind of a dystopian movie, it kind of is very glossy and shiny and bright. At least that's what they try to portray as the good things about the city. Um, Mainly Taco Bell. But also ta- Taco Bell. Taco Bell <laughs> surviving the franchise wars, yeah. Um, I got to go back and watch this movie is what I'm, is basically what I'm saying. I'm talking myself into it to going you back know, and see I didn't, everything that we've talked about tonight. After searching it, San Angeles was kind of a concept that existed before the film. Mm. I guess it was in an early draft of Blade Runner. It was in the 1994 movie Double Dragon. And then at the same time, it was put into Demolition Man, and it's and it's lived on since. So it is it kind of exists outside of that. Uh, the uh, um, the ver- San Angeles you know, feels feels like such an insult to Santa Barbara and San Diego. Yeah, yeah. This is like well, if we're not quite sure which is the sand part for either of you. Probably neither. Yeah, but you're basically LA Man adjacent. Did uh, did Wesley Snipes? quote himself in that movie because i know at one point he goes see you wouldn't want to be you in one movie and then he said in that movie too or something like that like like wow um okay well as the as the actual native angelino here uh, michael gets one freebie point what one freebie what point. yep i'm gonna give it to you but it's la story and richard gets that too so oh, what the fuck? Oh, okay uh and then uh, I, I'm such a big Ed Wood fan that I kind of want to go with that. And um, Richard, I know Swingers is dear and near to your heart, and it is mine. After I get to mine as well, after I got divorced, I saw Swingers, and it was the first movie that kind of gave me a little bit of hope. <laughs> that I was going to be able Aww. to, to uh, uh, pick up the pieces and move move on. So was that you put four? Your bowl, really? You put your bowling shirt right on, and you just yeah. <laughs> got back out there on the dance floor. And you just I sure did. Wallet chain and <laughs> squirrel. No, you zippers. need one more. One more. <laughs> okay. Uh, why don't we go uh, with Sunset Boulevard because it's a classic? So why don't we do that? Sounds good, my Cause, dudes. Because miss... you chose most of mine. So yeah. <laughs> sounds good. <laughs> I miss L.A. I miss L.A. Misses you. Guys. you. Oh, yeah. Open audition, the open auditions for the mayor, the new mayor of Burbank, oh, are not man. going well. Oh shoot! It's bad. I mean, it's 
bad out there. There's people that are just trying to trying uh, to do MC thing, MC skills in front of things, and everyone's falling yeah. down. It's they, they oh don't know God. what they're doing. The the no. the Burbank Bowl is falling apart because of I it. I make it look easy. I think that's the yeah. problem that all these challengers to the throne have when they go up there. Is like, you know, I, I, you need to come I, back riding it on a dragon. Yeah. <laughs> Smite down <laughs> all these all these foes. Yeah. All right, homies, this has been the Mount Rushmore of Films About Los Angeles. I'm Wise Jeff. I'm Richard. I'm Michael.